What's up, everybody? Welcome to the show. In this special bonus podcast, CT and I sit down with former Arizona Diamondbacks prospect and the man behind Fuller Hitting, Mr. Ryan Fuller. Baseball has undergone some changes over the last few years. We're seeing that analytics is kind of taking over the game, whereas the old school mindset is sort of starting to die out bit by bit. And this interview highlights this quite a bit. Now, Ryan Fuller never quite made it to the major leagues, but after undergoing a change to his swing uh, while in college, he saw vast improvements in his game. So much so that he went from playing at a junior college out of Connecticut to being picked up by UConn to play alongside guys like Matt Barnes, uh, George Springer, and Nick Ahmed. Later, he's drafted by the Arizona Diamondbacks. And he attributes all of this to working with Matt Harvey's father while in this junior college and being blown away by this new style of swinging at a baseball. And, um, you know, instead of swinging down on the ball, Matt Harvey's father taught him to use his body to swing on a level plane. And what happens when you stop swinging down on baseballs? It's quite obvious. You stop hitting ground balls. And when you start playing baseball at a college level, at a minor league level, at a big league level, ground balls are outs, just like uh, Josh Donaldson said in that video. In fact, according to that article that I kept mentioning last season, Countdown to Liftoff by Tom Verducci, grounders are out 75 plus percent of the time. So elevate the ball. That doesn't mean you swing, you hack at a ball, uppercut like a crazy person. But you try not to hit the ball on the ground. Now, you're a little leaguer. You're playing peewee baseball. Sure, those guys are going to make mistakes. But as soon as you get to a certain level, you're going to you're going to start seeing hits if you elevate the ball. So, yeah. So this interview was really interesting. And uh, I want to thank Ryan Fuller for coming on. And you guys should all check out Fuller Hitting on Instagram at Fuller Hitting. And go to Ryan Fuller's website, fullerhitting.com. Without further ado, here's Ryan Fuller. Tell us a little bit about Ryan Fuller. Where are you from? Uh, where did you grow up? All that stuff. You got it. So I'm a Connecticut guy, born and raised, played high school ball at a school with only 400 kids in it. Went on and played junior college baseball at UConn Avery Point, another really small junior college program, but we ended up having a great two years there. We played in the national championship game my second year where we lost in it. And from there, I was kind of a undersized kid, had a good amount of talent, but just 175 pounds soaking wet when I first got there. Okay. But through a lot of hard work, Matt Harvey's father was actually my hitting coach at the junior college. And he was the first guy that kind of got me interested in the swing and kind of getting away from just swing down and teaching a more on plane swing and using okay. your body, just kind of the things that are now accepted in baseball. And once working with him, it kind of clicked and I had a really good sophomore year and I got a opportunity to play at UConn. Mike Holt, the third baseman up there. He's uh, with the Red Sox. He's played with the Rangers. He got drafted, so they had a need at third base. I went up there and I walked into a great situation. They had Matt Barnes, George Springer, Nick Ahmed, just a really big talent base. And I walked into a good situation. We ended up going to the Super Regionals my junior year. I became captain my senior year. And through it all, I just loved hitting and I loved kind of looking for the aspects of the swing that weren't being taught everywhere else. It was easy to kind of go to the people who were stay tall, throw your hands down to the ball. And it was starting this guy, Bobby Tewksbury from New Hampshire up here, mm -hmm. Donaldson's guy. He was just starting to become mainstream and I was just like devouring anything he put out and then started implementing it in my own swing. And then I was lucky enough to get signed by the Diamondbacks. I played rookie ball with them for a year and it just started to click for me. But unfortunately, a little too late for 18 years of my life. I was thinking one way of swinging when I really was swinging a totally different way. And that kind of catapulted me into a coaching career. I've coached at Quinnipiac University, a small D1 in Connecticut. 
AAU. I coach high school ball now, and it's kind of just been this endless journey to figure out the swing even more and help kids get it at a much younger age than I did because I feel like when I swing the bat now, I know where everything is going. I know how everything is working together. And unfortunately, I'm 28 years old now, and it doesn't really matter at all. So helping kids figure it out earlier than that. So I give lessons out of a place called The Pit in Niantic, Connecticut now. And it's been a great thing. They have a lot of technology there and good people around me. And we're getting good kids in there who are going to hopefully have a great spring and get more kids in there as well. Cool. So you're in Connecticut. Are you, do you grow up a Red Sox fan or a Yankees fan? You're kind of right in the middle there. Yep. So Red Sox, <laughs> they've been having a really good run uh, too. When I was in high school is when they started <laughs> to go on a nice run. And so yeah, you yeah. guys know, like anything in New England, it's been just coming up aces right now for yeah. Patriots, Red Sox, anybody. So it's been a good run. It's insane, man. The New England area is going through some sort of moment right now that I don't think I've ever experienced. I'm a Yankees fan and I grew up with the the Yankees of the 90s. And I thought yeah. that was incredible. But, I mean, you got the Patriots. How many Super Bowls? Nine they've gone to? It's and they've crazy. only lost three? <laughs> the I Red know. Sox didn't win for 86 years, and then they went four in the last, you know, 15 years or so. CT, stop smiling. Just become uh, a Red Sox fan. Already, man. <laughs> never, man. Never. <laughs> never. We're, we're, we'll get it back. One season. One season. No, I'm good. Um, all right. So, you mentioned Bob Tewksbury, who uh, recently he's become kind of a superstar you know, behind the scenes and hitting. And these are things that you learned prior to this launch angle revolution and that Tom Verducci article that came out a couple of years ago. Um, was it, was that something that was easily accepted by you guys, by you especially? Like, is this something that you, you know, cause I'm sure that your whole life you were taught to swing down and all that stuff. Was it difficult for you to implement this new type of, you know, swing or, you know, did you see results right away? Yeah. I mean, my whole life, it was swing down on the ball. Yet when I would look at pictures, I would see the barrel was below my hands and I would see my hips totally turned to the pitcher. And I was like, that's not what I'm being told. I'm not doing what I'm being told. And either I'm not doing something right, but I'm having success with it. So when he was just talking about like the simple things, like the hips lead the hands and stuff, I would just kind of like play around with it at my house feeling. And I was like, that feels like the barrels being catapulted through the zone. That makes sense to me mm -hmm. versus my hands kind of getting in the way and feeling tight. And of course the smart thing, what anybody should do is you look at the guys who are having the most success, go watch Stan, go watch Mookie Betts. They don't swing tight. And I always felt tight when I was swinging. So I knew a change had to be made but there were no coaches who were helping me make those changes really occur. So Bobby, like anything he put out, and obviously he was working with Donaldson, Bautista, all those guys in Toronto, I would just watch their swing and watch their swings. And the more I learned today, reading the book, The Talent Code too, they say just by watching people who are successful, you're instinctively going to pick up parts of their swings too. So even though I didn't have a coach saying like, this is what you have to do. And then once you do that, you go to point B, it was kind of just trying things out and whatever they would put out, I would just try and emulate too. Mm -hmm. And then after a year, it started to really click when I was in pro ball too. And I just felt like I was using my body like an athlete rather than being a mo mechanical robot trying mm -hmm. to hit the ball. Well, it was Thanks. easier to get out of your head uh, when it comes to hitting. You were more natural with it. Um, exactly. Go ahead, CT. Yeah, uh, I always, I'm always curious, like with this new style of kind of swinging the bat. But you, you, you had success before that, right? Like the way, the method that you used leading up to this point, you had, you, you made it pretty far using the swinging down on the plane. And and when I was a kid, all the all the superstars, well, actually, A Rod was the only one that I paid attention to, but he always preached swinging down. So are they doing this intentionally or like? Are they still doing it? And does everybody need to do this to, to reach the next level? Or is it, you know, is it just like a tool? Yeah. Awesome question. And this for me, as a hitting coach, if you're bringing your kid to someone and they're saying like, this is the only way you should run out the door. 
because we always see those clips of guys like Trout or A-Rod when they're going through and they're talking about their progression and their process. I'm thinking about staying on top. I'm thinking about swinging down. And it's always that if that's what they're thinking, but that's not what they're doing. So this feel versus real. And I definitely had times, even when I started thinking about like, okay, I need to be on plane. I need to be attacking the ball out front to hit it in the air. I still needed to think I got to swing down and stay on top because guys are throwing 95 plus. And if I'm underneath it a little bit, I'm going to get beat. So even guys like Babe Ruth, I just watched a clip of Ott swinging the other day. These guys from like way back in the day, they're all doing the same things. Mm-hmm. The swings are all the same. It's not like in 1990 in the steroid era when guys mm-hmm. start hitting more home runs and new swing emerged. It's been that way. I think it's just we have different ways with technology of showing this works, but those thoughts, there's nothing wrong with having the thought of swinging down, but we just don't want to have kids actually think that their swing is going down when they're Mm -hmm. swinging, because we can clearly see with video technology today that the ball's coming in on a negative side of them playing. We want to at least be matching that to hit a line drive. Makes sense. It's funny because I I'm in nowhere near a hitting expert like you are, but um I saw that that video that CT referenced the Mike Trout one where he says that he focuses on hitting down, and I found video of him in slow motion and that's not what he's doing. But I guess if that's what works for him, if that's his mentality, then that's okay. That's what you're saying, right? Even though that's not exactly what you're doing. <clears throat> exactly, and I mean Trout, Bregman, all these guys who are having massive success. In their head, that could be what they're thinking. But yeah, clearly, whenever someone says it, because it's tough when Trout says that, all the dads are like, see, that's what I was right. taught growing up. If, if Mike Trout's saying it, it's got to be right. And then you kind of go back and you say, well, look at him where he actually is at contact. He's not swinging down the barrel, isn't above his hands. So right. it's that fine line. And you have to keep an open mind because you're going to hear five different things. But it really is going back to the metrics on there. I mean, they're the technology we have right now is still so far behind golf and the pitching world too, but we can put sensors on the body. We can see how the ball's coming off the bat, how the bat's going to the ball to have an objective way of looking at the swing now versus uh, one dad's opinion versus a coach's. Right. How, uh, so how, how deep does your coaching go? Is it, is it just, changing the approach of swinging more on a, on a, on a level plane, or does it go as deep as like the mental part of the game as well? Yeah. I think any coach who's worth their saw is going to be doing the whole gamut here. And you have to be because the kids who are coming to the cage, obviously, especially in the Northeast, as you guys know, they're going to see the field maybe five, Mm -hmm. six months at the most. So if you're just training mechanics, which some kids need, if they're coming in and their mechanics are jacked up, you have to make some different changes. But if you're not training for the game, the approach, the mental work, challenging yourself against velocity and breaking balls all year long, you're doing a disservice to the kid because a lot of the cages and instructors, it's kind of just come on in, hit off the tee a little bit. Let's have some fun they're not getting ready for the game. So when it goes to approach and mentality, you got to give them, here's the goal of what we're going to do for the next three months. You're hitting the ball at a level that is not going to help you be successful. You're hitting a ton of ground balls. We could see that's not going to be successful in the game. We're going to have these goals. And then I'm going to challenge the crap out of you. I want you to leave someday feeling like you didn't get better. But because that's how you're going to feel in the game. Nobody goes, you know, eight for eight and they walk out of the cage high fiving everybody in the game. So it's everything you guys know. You play baseball for a little bit. It's going to be challenging. It's going to be tough. And you're training to an extent. If the mechanics are broken, you got to fix it from there. But as you build it, you got to challenge guys. Cool. So tell us a little bit about what you're doing now. So you're you're clearly you're a hitting instructor. Do you have a facility you work out of or do you go and meet kids and players outside in their own you know, place? How do you go about your business? Yeah, so I kind of wear a few different hats. I'm a high school English teacher wow. during the day. And then at night, I kind of transition into the private hitting and coach. And then on the mm-hmm. weekends, that's pretty much what I do. 
And then, I mean, on top of that, like the social media has blown up too. So keeping up with that has been awesome just for connections too on there. I learned so much on there and everybody thinks like, oh, you know, you have this many followers. I'm learning just with everybody else. And there's guys on there who I'm DMing, like, how do you get your guys to get their back hip to clear like that? Like there's so much information on there, which is great. But the facility I work out of, it's called the pit in Niantic. It's run by... Becky and Tim Burroughs, they're great people, and they're also instructors there, too. And uh, it's a smaller place. It's right on the water in Connecticut, so the parents can drop their kids off, stay for a while. They can go walk on the beach. So it's a really nice location. And then in a few weeks on March 9th, my high school baseball season starts. I'm also a coach of the high school baseball team, Haddam Killingworth, that I teach at as well. So a lot of different hats kind of being – creative with the way I manage my time but it's it's a lot of fun because I get to work with kids at school who maybe don't play sports I get to connect with them I get to do my private guys who range from really good middle school players up to pro guys and then in high school too I get to see a lot so I see the different levels I see the changes and it kind of gives me not just working with the pro guys thinking everybody's like that I kind of always have to fine-tune the way I communicate and the things I'm doing so it's a cool area to be in just in teaching and coaching in general. Wow. Is your, uh, is your goal to be where you're at now in terms of coaching or do you eventually want to make it up to like the major league level and be like the official coach of a team? Yeah, it's crazy right now. I mean, Jason Ochart, the hitting guy from driveline, he just got signed on as the Phillies minor league hitting coordinator while he's still working at driveline. A ton of guys just through social media are getting major league jobs or Mm -hmm. minor league jobs as well. So it's like the things I never thought possible because it used to be to be a major league hitting coach. You had to be a major leaguer. But we're finding that those guys maybe aren't thinking about new ways. It was kind of just like, well, this worked for me and kind of imprinting it on everybody else. So. Yeah, this past off season, I've kind of been like, wow, these opportunities that I never thought were possible, maybe that is something. So I've kind of looked at it a little bit differently, saying like, you know, what do I really want? Because I, I've been in college coaching and I really didn't like having to go on the road every weekend to recruit. But the, the pro side, obviously, you know, when I work with pro guys, they're obviously better athletes. They're picking things up quicker. And you can see like, man, what I had in my head of what I wanted to do as a player on my own, like he's picking that up so quick. And then I have to find new ways of challenging him. So obviously guys at the big league level, that's going to be the ultimate challenge on the biggest stage. So I think that would be something long-term really cool, but I absolutely love what I'm doing right now and getting to work with all the people that I am. That's cool. And so you had mentioned previously that you were drafted by the, by the Arizona Diamondbacks. Um, could you tell us a little bit about your pro playing career? How long were you in the minor leagues? Um, you know, just walk us through that whole time period. Yeah, you got it. So coming out of high school, I had a a couple of offers at D twos, D threes, UConn actually out of high school, I went to their camp and they said like, dude, you're not good enough. Like you got to go get bigger. You got to figure it out on your own. So that's why I ended up going to junior college. But the thought of playing pro baseball, obviously, you know, when you're playing in the backyard with a ball, everything, it's like, yeah, I want to be a pro baseball player. But it was always kind of like, man, I got so much crap to figure out first, just getting to where I want to be at the division one level, that that's where all my attention was. And when I was at UConn, I freaking loved it. It was so much fun. I couldn't believe we get to fly on planes. We get to go play at Louisville. And then for spring break, we're going to Oregon. Like I was on cloud nine. And I really didn't even think about pro ball. And that was with like guys, George Springer, they're having scouts come every single practice just to see him like take a sip of water. And I would see that. And I was kind of like, you know, maybe that'll be an opportunity for me, but I'm still like way behind the eight ball right here. So it was always like just focus on college. And obviously like you guys know, when you're not focused on something else and you just stick to the process of being where you're at, you end up having a lot of success. So after my senior year, I was signed by the Diamondbacks. And when I got there, I was kind of disappointed. Uh, At UConn, man, I would give my left leg for a midweek win over Fairfield in the cold on a Wednesday. 
And then in pro ball, it was kind of like every man for himself. Everybody's yeah. just trying to climb the ladder. And there was a game when I kind of started to figure out like, man, like maybe this isn't going to be the best thing for me. It was a game that was in extra innings. And obviously if this were at UConn, it was like everybody pulling in the same direction, dying for that win. It didn't matter who it was. And the coach kind of brought us in. It was like the 13th inning. And he was like, we don't get paid extra for extra innings. Like, let's get this done. And so that inning, we ended up winning. And I was ready to dog pile on the field, run out <laughs> there and go nuts. And the coach kind of looked at me like, dude, you're a pro. Like, you don't do that anymore. And it just kind of was like, oh, man, like that. I, I play my best when I'm not thinking about myself. When I think yeah. about myself, I'm terrible. So that could be obviously my own personal situation on, in one organization. But from then on, I was like, you know, I got to kind of look into coaching where I can kind of be myself. So mm -hmm. it was awesome opportunity to learn from people. We had the, obviously the big league guys come down on their rehab assignments and stuff like that. So I played that whole year in the rookie league out in Arizona, which was awesome because you got to be at the facility, the spring training facility, play all the, the nice fields and everything. So from a learning standpoint and everything, it was fantastic. But from a player's perspective, I already had my degree from school and I was playing with 16, 17 year olds. It was kind of just like, all right, let's move it on. You know, maybe the major leagues, because that really wasn't ever a goal of mine to make it all the way up. I knew I wanted to coach and I knew I accomplished most of the things I wanted to in my playing career. And, you know, college for me was just a ton more fun. So that's kind of how it played out. Yeah, it seems like once you make it to the minors, it's not so much about the team anymore as opposed to trying to make it to the next, you know, the next level. Um, and I can see why that would be kind of difficult, you know what I mean? Because it's, it's hard to leave your heart out on, on the field when you're in that kind of situation. Yeah, and just to even, like, spring off that minor league uh, discussion, like, I, I kind of don't – now I kind of see things differently when a player comes through the ranks and he spends his whole first six years with a team and then he leaves, like, kind of kind of put things into perspective a little bit because what are they really staying there for, you know? Like, if it's really every man for themselves – on their way there you know i don't i'm kind of looking at things differently now <laughs> yeah so what what would you say so th this actually leads us into a pretty good a pretty off topic in terms of hitting but more about baseball itself right now um you know the thing with kyler murray recently where he chose the nfl as opposed to major league baseball and in my mind, I'm thinking, well, why, why would he choose baseball? As much as I love baseball, why would he choose to go through the minor league system and wait, you know, three, four years before he makes it to the big leagues? And then he's only going to get a sniff, you know, for a few games before he's finally, you know, if he's good enough, instilled, installed into the lineup maybe five years down the line. Um, do you feel like this, the way system the baseball is set up is... Is it attractive from what you see to college baseball players and, and maybe even high school players? Um, or are you seeing lesser interest in baseball because of that? What do you think? The Kyler Murray situation, I mean, that's like the biggest no-brainer to me in the world. You're yeah. going. <laughs> he's got, I mean, he'll go in the first round. He's going to get far more guaranteed money. Yeah. And he's going right to the top right away. And clearly – we see guys like Vladdy Jr. this year right. not starting the year in the big leagues just because they get one extra year on the back end Hate later that, to man. hold them down there. It's so stupid. So Kyler Murray, you look at a guy like that clearly ready to yeah. dominate at the big league level. He's going to be held back regardless of whether he hits 700 with 700 bombs. It doesn't matter from a business perspective. So right. I think – for the guys at the very high end first round, if you're a multi-sport athlete, baseball is not the attractive option for you just because the minor leagues is not sexy either. You could have your Mercedes Benz, BMW, whatever it is. It's a grind every single day. Yeah. Once you're to AAA, you're going to be flying a little bit, but for the rest, you're living on the road, on the bus, everything like that. Man, the NFL looks pretty good. First class treatment, everything like that. But for the rest of the guys, we have to remember – it's 40 rounds, the MLB draft, then guys are getting signed on top of that too. So they're kind of handcuffed too. You're going to get what you get. The guys, especially if you don't go your junior year, it's 
either take this contract or go out into the working world and figure it out too. So they have a lot of power both ways, but special talents who we need to keep in the game of baseball, we need to find a way to keep them there without looking ahead. You know, I'm going to be 24 years old, just getting a sniff at Mm -hmm. the big leagues versus, okay, I'm 20, 21 years old. I'm going right to the, the NFL. Right. I mean, look at Aaron judge. Aaron judge is 26 years old and he's, I think he has a, technically just two, I think two years of service time in baseball. So he's going to be 31 years old by the time he's a free agent. And then he's going to want to get paid. And who's going to pay a 31 year old, you know, guy of his size, who's probably going to be injury prone at that point, you know, a big, big term contract. It's, it's just, I think, I think it's, it's a problem for baseball because I just I saw a poll on Gallup, I think it was Gallup poll that, that uh, uh, ranked uh, the sport in popularity, and it's fallen under basketball. And um, I want I want kids to want to, you know, see Kyler Murray in an Oakland A's uniform this year. They're going to say, wow, like, I, that could be me. You know what I mean? Yeah. Let's get some interest in the game. Let's get people more involved. It's just, you know, it's, it's a shame. It disappointed me, but I don't blame him. I would have done the same exact thing he did. He's yep. going to be a household name next year. No matter how good or how bad he plays, everybody's going to be talking about Kyler Murray. Had he gone to baseball, he would have gone to the forgotten place. We wouldn't hear from him for another, you know, three, four years. Yeah. Um, so it's crazy. Um, all right. So could you tell us, have you worked with anyone in, in the big league level yet? Have you gotten to that point? Are you, you still working with kids in college and pro ball? Yep. So I've been doing it for eight years, but I would say the past two years, I've really kind of gone more mainstream where a lot of people know about me. So no big leaguers yet, but we got guys in the system who I'm hoping are going to be up there soon. And then I got a really good crop of high school kids who are going to be going to the division one level where they're hopefully going to be keep making strides up the ladder so it's it's really fun when you have guys who are competing at high levels to see what you're doing with them if it's working too and making adjustments from there it's not you know they didn't have success oh their coach must have messed with them you know i I take a lot of accountability in what we're doing and if people are going to come invest their time and money with me i want to make sure that they're going to be able to get where they want. So I'm really looking forward to this spring seeing guys develop and make big strides because they've been competing their butts off all fall and winter with me. Mm. So here's a little bit more of just like a, just a, I'm curious question. Who's your currently favorite swing in the major leagues and who's your all time favorite list? I mean, question. favorite swing. <laughs> yeah. I mean, right now I love watching Aaron judge, and obviously, you know, liking the Red Sox. But at this point, it really doesn't matter when you're looking no, at swings. He's a, he's a beast, yeah. He is a beast. And I mean, to move like he does with that huge frame, he keeps <laughs> it simple. But there's so much power generated in the right way, which I love. But my all-time favorite, I mean, going back to Bob Bobby Tewksbury, is Donaldson. I mean, how that guy moves is special because not many people are as loose and can move like him and control all those movements, the way he kind of ties it together, it's like a symphony. And a lot of people look at him and say like, Ooh, I'm going to have that leg kick. I'm going to have that big forward move. You can't do it like he does. There's only a few people who can move like him. Exactly. So watching him and I mean, it's going to be so much fun just having him hopefully healthy for the full year in Atlanta is going to be awesome. They're my sleeper world series pick. I think they're going to have such a big year. I agree. I think a lot of people are sleeping on Donaldson because he was injury prone last year. He was kind of injured a couple years ago as well, but the guy's a monster. The guy is a beast. And if you look at his swing, it's, it's unconventional in a lot of ways. That's a, that's a super high leg kick. He looks like a puppeteer liquor. I don't know. Like it's it's insane. (laughs) um that's awesome uh so all time who was your all-time guy i didn't get that i said donaldson yeah oh donaldson Donaldson. kind of i love him too but yeah we don't go that far back okay so so who so who would you who who do you wish you could coach not named donaldson or judge in the major leagues Ooh, man, I, I probably would love to go with J.D. Martinez for a little bit because that's a guy who has totally revamped his swing in the middle of a major league career. Mm-hmm. I mean, he had 
enough success to get to the major league level and then enough awareness to say what I'm doing is not going to cut it. He made the change and now obviously a World Series champion right in the middle of their order. So maybe not making changes to his swing, but just kind of being in the process of how did it used to feel? What did you do to change that? And kind of just picking his brain because when they have those clips of him and Mookie in the cage, it's Mm -hmm. just, I mean, awesome for anyone who appreciates hitting and guys who are not the big league level saying like, I just got to keep doing what I'm doing. They're looking for the edge. And there's, there's this thing we have in the hitting world now it's called the K vest. And it's a biomechanic thing where you put sensors on your, your hips, your torso, your shoulders, everything. And you could see exactly what is firing first to make sure you're in sequence. And Mm -hmm. most organizations are buying them now. But J.D. was one of the first guys to just say, like, I don't care if the Red Sox get on buying it on my own. So yeah. just that forward thinking mentality would be so much fun to be around. Was he JD, a, a Tewksbury? I'll, th- I'll, I'll thumbs up to J.D. Yes. Ooh. Was That's he a you, Tewksbury Manny. client, too? Uh, I know that he got he had one of these uh, innovative coaches as well revamp his swing. Was it Tewksbury? I don't think it was Tukes. I'd have to look into who it is. But obviously, it's somebody who's not teaching the old way and kind of it seems like he is a really cerebral learner too so you have to show Mm -hmm. kind of you could see him next to the cage all of his swings he's got the ipad next to it he's going through his movements too so i mean whoever was working with him that takes a special person too to kind of be in a team because so many times kids come in and kind of look at the coach and say like okay tell me everything i need to do and i'll just like yes sir you where really I got to figure out what works for you. I got to figure out how to communicate everything with you to make it stick. Because when you're in the box, I'm not there with you. There's nobody but you in there. You got to know your swing versus kind of getting those puppy eyes, looking at the coach like, did I do this that (laughs) time? Tell me what I did next time. So we got to look up who his coach was for sure, though. Right. Uh, So how do you do that? How do you communicate, you know, what a kid should feel you know, when that's hard, that's hard to do. You're getting in somebody's Hardest head thing. in some ways. Hardest so how, thing to do. I was d- does being an English teacher help you or something? Like, how do you do that? Yeah, I think being a teacher is huge. You're going to learn the types of learners, guys who yeah. need that maybe physical adjustment, guys who are going to verbally understand it better, having video to show it and then put that video next to a guy like a trout or someone to mimic those movements figuring out what kind of learner there is is huge and then i'm really big and again going back to that book the talent code i love that book so much they went to all the hotbeds of talent around the world they went to brazil for soccer they went to the dr for baseball and they found all these hotbeds just focus on training they don't Mm -hmm. play a lot of games they just focus on like one thing at a time So I'm big on slowing things down and instead of going in the cage and, okay, we talked about five things, go put them in. Let's just focus on one thing at a time. Mm -hmm. So going really, really slow and then the whole time having a conversation, you know, what did that feel like? How are you going to remember to do that in the game? And then mostly a conversation between the two of us, because like I said, they need to know their swing better than anybody else. So it's like playing the piano. When you learn how to play the piano, you learn one key at a time. You don't go in there and you're doing Mozart right off the bat. So it's the same thing with learning. But unfortunately, baseball just doesn't make a whole lot of sense when we're teaching it, unfortunately. That's true. So the talent code, this is the one. This is by Daniel Coyle. Is that the one you're... Yep. All right, I want to make sure I mention that in the intro. Um, I'm going to have to read it now. <laughs> yeah. I'm- yeah, it's excellent. And they have one called the culture code. I which is all too. about like teams, the Spurs are in there and just all the most successful teams and people, how they got there. And obviously they're all sharing the same qualities as well. Do, do you have a, a favorite training method or tool like hitting off the tee or anything? Yeah, the tee is getting knocked in the hitting world right now. And no. yeah, the tee is knocked, which I, I totally get because they'll put like, if you're facing Roger Federer, and he's serving at you at 140 miles per hour, you don't practice hitting off a tee. That's right. Serve. So again, it's just like, what are other sports doing? 
why is baseball doing it one way? So I do enjoy the tee, especially for the guys who need that mechanical adjustment where the ball's not moving and they can really focus on what they're doing. But there's this theory out there, constraints led approach, which I am huge on. It's basically putting guys in tough positions or tough atmospheres to get a change to come out. So instead of telling a guy over and over again, use your legs, use your legs, I'm just going to put them in a really wide stance and say, okay, swing from there and figure it out. The guy's going to naturally figure out, okay, that's how it feels to be in my legs and use my hips and feel more connected to the ground. Or maybe it's only <coughs> this round is a pull round. You're hitting at Fenway Park. You can only hit the ball off the green monster. Right. That's a way to learn how to pull the ball. So yeah. all these different ways versus just having the coach on the side like, no, don't do that. No, do this. It's kind of just – Here's the task at hand. Here's a challenge. Figure out a way to overcome it. And with that, it's been unbelievable because they're going through like you would at school. If you have a math problem, they're trying to figure out ways to accomplish the task at hand versus someone else telling them good job or bad job. So I really like using constraints. It's been fantastic. Uh, why are people against? I, I, I don't understand why. Again, I'm not a hitter. Uh, I, but CT played at a higher level than I did high school, right? And you high guys played. That's... We played amateur ball for a while. Um, I don't understand why why a tee would be such a bad thing. Because sure, you're not facing live pitching, but you're working on, like you said, the mechanics. You know, are your movements correct? You know, are you are you actually swinging the bat correctly? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like there is an advantage. So you see guys hit off a tee in, in, in pro ball too, in major league baseball, when they come back from injury. Um, is there a reason why people are against it? I think it's just the way that people have been going about their training usually. And we see, still see it at the cage because people will come in just to rent out the space and kind of swing on their own. What usually happens is Johnny and dad come into the cage and, they have 30 minutes, they'll swing off the tee for 20 minutes, and then dad will throw them really terrible BP for the last 10, <laughs> and then they're out the door. Yeah. So I think people are just understanding, like, when you go to the cage, even though you're getting your work in, in air quotes, you're not really simulating what the game is going to ask. And we see, obviously, even at the lower levels, guys are throwing harder. They're getting on lifting programs at younger ages. They're doing weighted balls all that stuff. So the demands of hitting are a lot harder. And I think people are just trying to let them know that there's a lot more to hitting than going to the cage and hitting off the tee and getting some flips yeah. and thinking you're ready for the game. Yeah. I guess I'm, I, I was a teacher too, uh, in New York city for seven years, unfortunately. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> that was tough. <laughs> uh, but I could, I'm thinking of it in terms of, you mentioned something before, how you use your teaching to, to help your, your, uh, your clients, I guess let's call them. For me, I would look at it as like a leveled thing. Like the first thing we're going to do before you do anything is you're going to hit off a tee. And once you master that, then you can move up to, I don't know, seeing balls out of a, a machine. I don't know. And then live pitching and then this and then that, I, you know, but that's just me. I don't want to harp on that. <laughs> no, that's uh, so true. And they really say the difference between guys in the minor leagues, guys in college and the big league guys, they just do the really boring things a lot better than anybody else. Mm-hmm. Even if it's hitting off the tee, I'm sure they could beat the crap out of us just because they have such a good understanding. And it's the fundamentals you can go back to. It's not, okay, I'm going to swing like Donald's saying and just right. put me out there. He's put in so much time, so much effort to make it look easy. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's a huge part of it, too. They just do boring a lot better than anybody else. I have to Wait. ask a Yankees-based question, CT. I'm sorry. No, so, go for it. And before I do that, I just wanted to mention something you said earlier. I was writing, so I write for Call to the Pen. It's a it's a baseball site for fan sided, and um, uh, I was writing a piece on Babe Ruth because I was watching tape of him too, and I noticed that his swing is very similar, or was very similar to, or let me rephrase that, Giancarlo Stanton's swing is very similar to Babe Ruth's. I noticed a, a similarity. It's open, and it's exaggerated, and it looks ugly. Like if you if you really okay. watch it. Um, so, but that leads me into the next question. Giancarlo Stanton swing. It's always, uh, criticized. He, it looks ugly. It looks weird. Um, when you watch it, 
do you see anything wrong with the swing? Or obviously, there's nothing wrong with it because the guy is a beast. But Good if question. if he was your client, is there something that you would tell him to adjust to maybe cut down on strikeouts or something like that, based on what you see? Yeah, and guys are always knocking on me because on my page I put up any big leaguer. In my opinion, if you're good enough to get to the major leagues, you got to swing that plays. I put up Logan Morrison the other day, and people are like, oh, yeah, really learn from Logan Morrison. And it's like, yeah, dude, he's going to make it further than 99% (laughs) of the people watching. So in terms of swings, if they're at that level, and especially like a Giancarlo Stan, if he has the years he has, something's working. But clearly everybody's going to go to that really closed stance. But what I'm looking for if somebody's closed and like the kids who are trying to do it and mimicking him, they're never able to clear their hips or turn all the way through to get to that ball on in the inside part. Normally they're going to cut themselves off. He's so good at understanding contact points too, especially for that inside pitch where any other guy would get buzz sawed inside. Mm-hmm. He clears early attacks way out in front to pull that ball. But like we see all the time, it doesn't even matter. Guys are trying to beat him in. Okay. Maybe he'll foul foul it off that right center field alley is just what he's always locked in on. So for me, it's kind of an aesthetics thing. You don't like the way it looks, but the Mm -hmm. results are there and he's moving really well. And obviously he can move at a sequence. And what I mean, the kinematic sequence, how all rotationals, swingers, hitters, hockey players, golfers, it should go your hips, your torso, your shoulders, and then whatever stick you're swinging in your hands. Mm -hmm. He can be out of sequence. His shoulders could go first. Because he's so strong, he can still make it work. So that's a guy who's obviously mixing talent, just pure talent and power together Mm -hmm. to get it done. So he can do things a lot of other people can't do. So why should he look like everybody else just to please a guy who's saying, okay, that's a good swing versus – that's right. a unique swing. Right. Yeah. And Good and point. similar to to JD as you said, last year Giancarlo maybe had a uh you know, it wasn't such a good season as opposed to his MVP season, but in that MVP season what people overlook is that he made an adjustment uh mid-season. He closed the stance even more and he saw more success doing that. So whatever he's doing works for me. I just hope he has a better year this year cuz I want a World <laughs> Series to yep. to respond to you guys. Uh <laughs> Um, so, okay. So tell our listeners how they can find you, um, what kind of services you provide, stuff like that. Sure. So everything's pretty new. I just came out with a website on new year's day of this year and that's fuller hitting.com. And that's the same, my Instagram handle, Twitter, all that stuff, fuller hitting. And I came out with, uh, two eBooks. One is a constraints manual, the things we were talking about, placing challenges on hitters. It's uh, totally free. And if anybody wants that, they could DM me. I put it up on my Instagram page quite a bit. So Mm -hmm. that's totally free. And then I have a paid eBook. It's called the line drive handbook. And really more than anything else, it's just a, a really a drill book that goes into detail on what elite swings look like, because even though we see Giancarlo Stanton guys with closed stances, open stances, they all kind of get to the same spot when they're at their launch position, when their front foot lands. It's eerily similar how every guy looks. So just talking about here's what good posture looks like from the best guys in the world, and then it takes them through the drills that they can choose from. So when they go to the cage, rather than just swinging off the tee and hitting off dad for a half an hour, Here's some drills and they go through what they're going to help, how you should be doing it. And they have videos in there. So hopefully guys can build routines around it. And that's the line drive handbook on the website as well. Cool. Did you ever, do you have a YouTube channel by any chance? I I have a YouTube channel. It's fuller hitting as well on there right now. We're building it up, but it's mostly guys sending in swings. So Mm -hmm. we do swing analysis work too. If guys want to have their swing critiqued from, I have, Guys in Australia, all over the country send in swings, and we kind of do remote training too, which is super, super cool. Again, people I would never be able to work with if it weren't for just the internet really at all. So that's a really cool part too. 
Here's a random question, nice. and I was about to sign off, but this just this just popped up on me, and it's, a, yeah. it's something else. I feel like I'm criticizing. I'm in a moment right now where I'm criticizing baseball a little too much, um, <laughs> so just get ready for that. Um, this is more about uh, information sharing. We just interviewed Brent Porcio of Top Velocity a couple of days ago, and he's running into into some problems with with lawsuits involving Major League Baseball and Trevor Bauer for using. Uh, player footage and stuff like that in his in his work. Have you ever run into a problem like that where you post something from a player and uh, maybe somebody asks you to take it down or you're or you're forbidden from using it? I mean, here's another example. Uh, Big Cat, did you listen to the podcast with A Rod? He said oh, yeah. that that Twitter shut him down because he was posting too many uh, Chicago Cub home runs. And <laughs> For me, I'm just like that's it's counterintuitive because you want the content out there. You want people to see baseball anywhere, you know, anywhere you look, you want to see baseball to get the the product, you know, more eyeballs. Have you ever run into any of that any of those problems when you post anything like this? Or do you even use major league baseball players in your examples with students and stuff like that? Yeah, definitely. It's definitely something you're going to run into. And I always worry because Major League Baseball is unlike anyone other, you know, NFL, NBA. They want their content out there. They want it to be reposted. And baseball, I've had even people who will take their camera and video the TV of Major League Baseball. So it's not their own content. They were just, you know, they got up off their couch and filmed it. And then other people start sharing it. And yeah. then I see, man, that's really good content. My viewers are going to get something out of that. I'll repost it. And then the guy who took his camera on the TV will DM me and say, dude, that's my photo. Either take it down <laughs> or give me credit. And it's like, that's not yours. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, it's people on there too. And I think I have a lot more laid back personality than most people too. People, if they want to take my stuff on my page, awesome. Hopefully somebody can learn from it. But Yeah, it's that whole thing of Major League Baseball, too. It's just so behind everybody else in the coaching world, in the content creation world, too, that they need to start figuring out the more eyeballs on you, good, bad, or indifferent, is going to be better for everybody on there, too. And the guys on Instagram, I can't believe it because you go on to even, like, the eighth guy on an NBA team, they'll have, like, a couple hundred thousand followers Mm -hmm. on Instagram. You go to like starting shortstops in the major leagues and they have like 15,000. Yeah. Crazy. So these guys who could have the opportunity of getting more endorsements, more sponsorship deals, they don't even have the eyes on them too. And I think that all kind of starts from the top and trickles down as well. I agree. And I think that, that uh, it, it, it handcuffs guys like you because uh, if I was a hitting instructor or a pitching, you know, pitching coach or something – I would be mortified to use a big leaguer as an example in one of my videos or something because heaven forbid they come after me. There's no way I can fight Major League Baseball. You know what I mean? Right. But by the same token, if I want to teach a kid something that he should be doing to to be successful, you want to mimic the guys who are doing it at the highest level. But you but you can't. So I don't know, man. Uh, it's something – if you haven't listened to that podcast, I can't believe I'm plugging another podcast on our own podcast. But <laughs> – the uh the uh it's called the corp with alex rodriguez and he they interviewed gary v and they go into this and it's it's an it's an incredible conversation and uh i hope that baseball makes this change too because yeah man we're losing traction i'm afraid that we're gonna <laughs> that baseball's gonna you know become the next hockey or something no offense to hockey no but. i hope not <laughs> <laughs> all right ryan this was fun man we, we'd love to having you on and uh we hope you'll come back on sometime soon i hope that i see this year you're gonna get a you're gonna get a big league player. I can see it. <laughs> that'd be <laughs> awesome. I hope I come on and I'm able to say that. That'd be awesome. Yeah, that would be nice. awesome, man. Thank you so much. Thank you guys. Nice. Appreciate it. Thanks again to Ryan Fuller for coming on the show, and thank you for listening. As always, this episode is brought to you by Audible. Go to audibletrial.com forward slash welcome to the show to get a free audio book download and a 30 day free trial. Two books to recommend for you from Ryan Fuller, the talent code and the culture code. Those are available on Audible. You can get one for free using the using audibletrial.com forward slash welcome to the show. 
Also, for more exclusive details, like 10% off of KD Custom Kicks, where Major League Baseball players like Aaron Judge get their custom cleats and sneakers, visit WTTSPod.com forward slash save. That's WTTSPod.com forward slash save. Music is by VM Varga and Rapternal Music by Naughty Productions. And all the artwork for this show is by Luigi Gomez. Thank you so much for listening. Peace. Peace.